Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, my guest today was first on our channel quite some time ago. He's been on a number of times. When he first came on, it was to talk about the BBC, but life has gone on quite a bit since then. He's become a very well-known face on our screens. Calvin Robinson was formerly a teacher. He's now a senior research fellow at Policy Exchange. He's also part of the Don't Divide Us campaign and indeed the Defund the BBC campaign. And he is on everything from talk radio to sky, all of them uh, much, much more. Um, he's made time to be with us today. Thanks very much indeed, Calvin, for coming on. Peter, it's an absolute um, pleasure. Oh, it's, it's great to see you. Um, yeah, it's been a bit of a... a a quick rise for you, hasn't it, over the past year? You know, you've been doing more and more. Yeah, it's been ridiculous. I think lockdown means that I've been stuck at home on Zoom, able to jump from one media uh, output to the next and just talk about the issues that are so important to not just to me, but to society right now. Yeah. You know, race, education, defunding the BBC, yeah. or all these grassroots causes that people really care about. Well, they certainly do on this channel. <laughs> uh, so uh, you're amongst... Friends, but what's it been like for you? Because I mean, you were a teacher, weren't you? Mm. And you've, you've, th that's finished now, isn't yeah. it? But uh, have you been, is it the right way to put it, enjoying it or? Um, yeah, no, it's great. So I've been campaigning for a long time, uh, part of a larger movement. Yeah. But, but now I think I've reached a point where people, uh, so, so as a school teacher, I campaigned about the indoctrination of children in mm. schools to a left-wing mentality and it felt very isolating. I felt like I was the only one who was a conservative teacher and every now and then I'd hear from other people but now that my voice is becoming a little bit more prominent I hear from lots and lots of people who say yes I also am a conservative teacher or I also care about this cause mm. thank you for speaking up on this so it's much less isolating now I feel like I'm part of a, a wider movement yeah which yeah. is what we call the silent majority isn't it? Well yes exactly you, though, uh, I would say, really have run the gauntlet in terms of people basically insulting you, I mean, <laughs> and having a go. But, you know, this week, we're doing this now in on April the 13th, I think, no, 14th, but I think just only in the past week, you had a very nasty run in with someone on talk radio, would it have been? Ah, uh, yes, yes, yeah. Ken Hines, yes. And uh, basically, the, the, what is the basis of what they... Why did they go for you, do you think, Calvin? Well, this is the problem, isn't it? Because I'm I'm a right-wing thinker. I, I work for a right-wing policy think tank. I, I write for right-wing papers. I have right-wing opinions. That shouldn't be a problem. But because I'm brown with those opinions and those perspectives, that is an issue. Because the left seem to think that they own black people and yeah, they yeah. own ethnic minorities. And mm. I'm like, well, you don't own me. Mm. I'm, I'm an individual. Uh, this is an equal opportunities country with, we're working towards meritocracy. Anyone can believe anything, anyone can do anything. Mm. And that should be celebrated because that's diversity, that's equality. But the left don't want to leave that. What they want to say is, you know, as a brown person, as an ethnic minority, you should be left leading. And they say that because they want my votes, they want our votes. They think we are a block vote yeah. and that we're one homogenous group that thinks and talks the same so that they can use us as a form of control. So you think it is about that, though? Absolutely. About it's control. about getting into power. You know, Joe Biden in America said, if you don't vote Democrat, you ain't black. Mm. Jeremy Corbyn over here said that uh, the Labour Party will unleash your potential as an ethnic minority. And it's like, mm. well, no, that's patronizing as hell. We don't need anyone to unleash our potential. We are people just as much as anyone else. Uh, it's, it comes down to this whole dividing of society into white versus non-white, or as we call them now, BMEs. Uh, I think it's ridiculous and it's very condescending of the left to talk to us and treat us that way. Whereas the right tend to see people as individuals and say, you know, get on with it. Uh, we'll, mm. we'll give you a hand up, but we won't give you a hand out. Uh, we won't treat you special just because you have different immutable characteristics than what we have. Uh, everyone is equal. And that's the yeah. way I see the world. Yeah. It's interesting you know, because we, we've just uh, spoken, I've just interviewed a documentary maker called Martin Durkin. Mm. He made a program called uh, Brexit the Movie, which was quite a, quite a big documentary. It's fantastic. Um, he's just done one about what he calls the great American race game. And it goes into this thing entirely. And it sort of looks at the way in which there was a moment at which the Democrats, who had previously been no friend of black people in America, yeah. offered welfare on the most colossal scale yeah. and essentially sort of kept this, said, you know, you've got to be with us. Um, 
a form of control, as, as you said. It's dark, isn't it? But this is what the left do. They want to keep, they want to hold people down because yeah. that's how they get that control. If you're dependent on the welfare state, you're dependent on the left. Whereas we on the right, I like to believe, we want to, like I say, give people a hand up and help people achieve things through their own rights and responsibilities yeah. rather than relying on the state or anyone else. And, you know, you mentioned in America, the D Democratic Party were the party of the KKK. Yes, yes. It was yes. the Republican Party that were the party of emancipation. But people have forgotten their history and seem to think that the Democrats are pro-BME or BAME or BIPOC or whatever, and that the Republican Party are racist because orange man bad. And it's, it's such a juvenile perspective on politics. Mm. With that in mind, what do you make of the recent report that was done, headed up by Tony Saul? Mm. Um, huge reaction against it from what you might call the usual suspects, people who would criticise it. Yeah. But have you read it? I have indeed. You've read the whole thing, have you? Yeah. What, what do you make of it? I'm a huge fan. And we'll get to the, the detractors in a moment. But yeah. the actual report, I think, is fantastic. Mm. What it does is it looks at our society and says, where are racial disparities? And then when it finds them, it says, what is the cause of these racial disparities? What it doesn't do is make assumptions. It doesn't say, okay, here is a racial disparity, therefore this is racism in this institution. Right. And the report didn't find any evidence of institutional racism, and that has been the uproar around the report. But if everyone could come together, left, right, doesn't matter, and look at the report, and look at the suggestions, they're all very positive, great ways of improving our society for everyone, uh, we should all unite behind them and say, yes, let's hold the government to account and make sure that this happens. But these detractors are very partisan. And what they, you know, these are race hustlers, essentially, that make money off of our society being divided. These are the people that sell these white man-hating books and sell these unconscious bias training courses. It's in their best interest for us to be at each other's throats. Mm. So of course they don't like the report because mm. it didn't find any evidence of institutional racism. It didn't say that that isn't a thing and doesn't exist, it just didn't find any evidence of it. But it did find many, many racial disparities and provided very, very sensible ideas to solve them or work towards improving them. What, what, were you surprised by the report? Not by the report, I was surprised by the reaction the amount of vitriol from the wokists, from the hard left, who the ones who keep perpetuating this myth that this is a racist country, mm. um, they couldn't get their heads around the fact that there was no evidence of that. And of mm. course, racism does exist. And I'll, I have to I have to always say this. Yeah, people, yeah. Calvin, you're denying racism. I'm not denying racism. Trust me. I've experienced plenty of racism in, in my life to know it exists. But what this report finds is that this is, not, this is not a racist country. And there's a difference between individuals being racist and an institution or a system being racist. Mm. When I said surprised, I suppose really what I meant is that it wouldn't have surprised me at all if this government had taken the soft option mm. and sort of said, oh, you know, in the wake of Black Lives Matter, that somehow or other, uh, you've got a point, yes, you know, that kind of approach. Right. But they really, they, they didn't seem to actually. They went out on a, what is now an ideological whim, uh, uh, you know, uh, on, on an arm, you know, basically he's saying, look, you know, we cannot find, we're not denying it, we cannot find what you are saying. That was sort of unusual. Well, them. let's not forget, this is an independent report and all of the commissions mm. on this report were respected individuals in their own fields from a wide variety of different backgrounds. Mm. Uh, so it's not that the government has this particular agenda, it's that this report was the result of a commission. Uh, but what I'm worried about is whether the government will follow through on the actions recommended in the report. It seems to me that they might back away because they're afraid of the woke mob. And all of these detractors yeah. that we mentioned are really against the report. So I think the government might actually take a step back and leave it. And I hope they don't do that because there are such, there are such good recommendations that we need to follow through with. Can you just give us a few of the ones that you think are most important, the recommendations? Yeah. So I'm an educationalist myself, so I looked at the educational stuff um, primarily. And for example, we spend a lot of time in... English education looking at the lowest performing pupils and why they are lowest performing. We know that black Caribbean kids and white British kids are at the bottom, uh, just above gypsies and travellers, but we spend so much time looking at the bottom of the leaderboard that we never actually stop to look at the top. And this report says, let's look at the higher performing individuals. Mm. Why are Chinese kids doing so well? Why are Indian kids doing so well? What is it that's going on there? And how do we take that best practice and replicate it? And what they found was that it's not actually the education system that's promoting, you know, it doesn't promote certain ethnic groups over others. Mm. It's actually down to family structure and the belief that 
um, education is the best route uh, out of poverty mm. and that social mobility this, this is a very Thatcherite policy that social mobility is a tool for everyone and you access it through education if you want to improve your life chances you work hard at school and we and the report found that you know newer immigrants to this country still held those beliefs in their family like the parents would push their kids to work hard to achieve better and this mm. is why black African kids tend to do better than black Caribbean kids because right. of course black Caribbean kids have been integrated into our society a lot longer, speaking as, as one myself, than black African kids have. Uh, so newer immigrants tend to have a better outlook on education and social mobility than people that, that have been in the UK for a longer ter- time. I see, so it's basically about family attitudes to, to education, to, to life. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it seems to me to be quite clear that that's the case. You know, I, I know that there was a think tank in, in this building, Civitas, who were doing educational programs. Mm. And in fact, it was the, the, the lowest take up was in white working class yeah. areas, yeah. for example. You know, this was a, a extracurricular sort of lessons for kids. Yeah. Uh, thing. But um, how long were you a teacher for? Then? Um, just over six years. Okay. I stopped teaching uh, during the first lockdown. Oh, right. I moved on to different things, but yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. But what were you teaching, actually? Computer was science, mostly. Computer I was science. an assistant principal as well, so I had whole school responsibilities, but right. it was a very rewarding job, and I recommend anyone to have a go at it. Right, okay. But where are you originally from? Are you, you're not, are you, are you from, I'm trying to work out your right, are you from the Midlands? Yep. Or you, I'm yeah, I'm from Mansfield, Nottinghamshire. Yeah. Um, I came down here for university and stayed. In fact, that was a, a, an enlightening thing for me, you know, starting to teach in London schools, whereas my only experience of schools was in the Midlands. Yeah. I was one of less than a handful of ethnic minorities in my school. But of course, London schools are the other way around. Mm. And I, I saw very, very different things uh, in, in London schools than what I experienced for myself growing up. Yeah, yeah. For example, the, the prominence of, of racism, and I talk a lot about anti-white racism because this is something that is very particular to London schools in that to be a white British kid is a minority at this point. Mm. And I, I saw that you know, a lot of white kids were getting bullied because of the color of their skin, which is why I stand up so firmly against this idea of white privilege, yeah. that just being born white means you have a privilege and being born um, brown or, or, or black means that you don't. Uh, it's, not as that, it's not that simple. Society yeah. is much more complicated than that. But obviously for, you, for someone of your passions and your particular views, uh, is this something that, you know, you had early on in life? Or is it something, you know, or did you sort of suddenly become more politically interested in your 20s? Or um, I've always been politically interested. Uh, one of the reasons I became a teacher was because of Michael Gove's initiatives. Uh, you know, a, a solid knowledge-rich curriculum, uh, mm. the teacher being the expert in the room, passing on that knowledge to the next generation. That's what education should be about to me. Mm-hmm. And in my field, computer science, we need more um, you know, young people with those skills and that, that knowledge, and we don't have it at the moment. Mm. I was in industry before, and we were recruiting a lot of people from East Asia and Eastern Europe. And I thought, well, why can't we get any homegrown talent? Where, where are the programmers? You know, everyone loves computing. Uh, so that's the reason I became a teacher in the first place. But then I saw that it was just full of politics. 80 to 90% of teachers and academics vote for left-leaning parties mm. and voted for Remain. And this was very obvious by the, 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 the approach that they take and, and the way they talk to pupils. And it's just rife with indoctrination. So I, that's one of the reasons I entered politics to kind of talk about this and, and make it known. Because I think if parents were aware what was going on in schools, quite often they'd be, you know, outraged. I think they are becoming increasingly aware, actually. I mean, you know, that it's to the point where I hear homeschooling mentioned more and more, and I can understand it. Yeah. You know, I mean, what's your what's your feeling about that? As a teacher, I highly recommend homeschooling. <laughs> I, you know. It, it used to be the case that I could think of one state school that I would send my kids to, but even that's gone woke now. They were teaching Black Lives Matter stuff over the last lockdown. Mm. I can't think of a single school, state school in this country that I would want to send my kids to. I would, I would rather teach them myself and, and mm. team up with other educationalists to, to do that. And I think it's, you know, it is the parents' job to educate their children. Mm. And we've forgotten that state schooling should be supplementary. It should be helping parents teach their kids. It shouldn't Mm. be replacing parents. And that's what we've started to do. And we've started to see that. Even with a conservative government, some of the policies around education, uh, such as the new relationship, sex and health education, which is abysmal, uh, has been, uh, you know, replacing parents' rights and responsibilities. Mm. That's not okay. Uh, In what way abysmal? Uh, Well, we've always taught sex ed in... uh, 
secondary school yeah. or, or high school and now it's been pushed down into primary school with this new relationship and mm. sex head by bringing it all together into one one group one topic uh, and we're seeing you know primary school kids being taught about masturbation mm. uh, and really inappropriate sub subjects like that and we're, we're seeing much more you know liberal progressive takes on sexuality and trans rights issues being taught at mm. such a young age when, they, when they're not ready to understand it. Right. Uh, and we used to have parental rights to remove your kid from a sex education class, and that has been removed now as well. This is another case of you know the state taking over, uh, educating our young people. And with the left-wing indoctrination that I talked about earlier, pair that together, it's very worrying when we've got Stonewall and Mermaids and these yeah. extremist left-wing organizations infiltrating schools by providing free resources for schools to use and by going in to deliver sessions in schools. And th there's no opposing voice, or there are a few opposing voices, but it's not as, they're not as loud. Mm. Uh, it's very, very worrying what's going on in that, in that area. The, with, uh, recently, we had this, uh, there was a, a story about a report about primary no nursery school kids being told about white privilege and i just wonder you know someone who's was in teaching is that does that ring true to you or does that sound a bit like clickbait to you i mean could, do you think there is there is something in that report or not oh yeah absolutely i've just done you a do. bit of research for policy exchange on this in that looking into the teaching resources and, and we looked at the most popular teaching resource website and looked at the materials on there and they were all comp pretty much all compromised uh, with critical race theory, with identity mm. politics, with all these left-wing ideologies that are actually illegal to teach as fact in schools. Mm. And the Equalities Minister has stood in the House of Parliament at the dispatch box and said that schools should not be teaching these ideologies as fact, as uncontested facts. Camille has been doing Indeed. this. Indeed, yeah. yeah. Uh, she was on the London Assembly with me for a matter of months before yes. <laughs> before she was uh, then uh, elected to uh, to Parliament. She was she was obviously very bright, you know. And, She's um, fantastic on yeah, this stuff. Yeah, she is. How much backing do people like her have in the government, though, when they say this? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? I, I don't want to get into bashing the government too much, but we've got a conservative government that is neither conservative nor liberal at this point. You know, there used mm. to be. I've spent a lot of man hours campaigning for this party, and. You know, I used to talk about them being the party of fiscal responsibility and mm. you know, now they've found the magic money tree and they seem to be spending their way out of pandemic. Uh, they used to be the party that protected civil liberties and stood up for our freedoms and they're, the, they're now the government that have stripped them all away. So I don't really know what they are and what they stand for anymore. Uh, COVID has had a detrimental effect on them. I'm hoping they'll get their act together and come back after COVID. But mm. where are the conservatives in the government? Yes, quite. Actually, with the COVID uh, effect on schools, i.e. kids being at home, that was a sort of perfect opportunity almost to see what how homeschooling could possibly work, wasn't it really? But I don't think it seems to have worked. No, because there's a massive class divide mm. there. Mm. And the social divide has widened throughout mm. lockdown in that, you know, kids from middle class or upper middle class backgrounds with multiple electronic devices at home and fast broadband, they did really well. And they usually had, you know, schools that were contacting them on a daily basis um, to make sure that they're getting on with their work. But kids from deprived areas with, who maybe have one smartphone in their house, no computer, maybe no broadband. Uh, if they do have a computer, they might not have a dedicated quiet place to yeah, work or yeah. they might have siblings to share it with or a parent working from home. And the, the the divide was so obvious to us in schools and it's a very difficult one for anyone to plug because you know there's there's not the money there to kind of just say okay we'll, we'll get universal broadband and, mm -hmm. and give everyone a laptop and uh, you know the government did try with those kind of initiatives but it's just not really practical on a large scale mm -hmm. um, so it didn't work in that way and i think we've now got probably you know, most kids missed out on some education, but kids from deprived backgrounds yes. or kids from working class backgrounds missed out on more than those from middle class and upper middle classes, which is not helpful when I talk about education being the, the greatest tool for social mobility. You know, well, on that point, I was a teenager in the 70s, which was the last great era of social mobility, mm. actually. Mm. Um, and in fact, you know, just as yesterday, um, you know, there, uh, Shirley Williams died and I don't know whether you you know she's very she bought very large in my growing up she she was the education minister for labor and she's been very admired but she was one that drove through the destruction of the grammar schools I mean or, or rather the you know introduction of pretty much universal comprehensive education yeah. carried on it has to be said by Margaret Thatcher 
Um, but when it comes to social mobility, they seem to be pretty without parallel. I mean, I, I wonder, are you a supporter of grammar schools or? Massively so. Did you did you go to one? Or no, I went you... to a former grammar in the Midlands. We had a, a quite a different situation up there. Yeah. I had a middle school um, yeah. set up similar to America. But what I see, in, we have schools that are set up for people that are good, good at sports, yeah. uh, good at technology. Why do we not have schools set up for the academically talented and gifted and mm -hmm. um, that's that's not a problem i think what we should do is focus on people's strengths and talents and really encourage them really push them the state system the comprehensive system rather doesn't really work in that kids that are higher ability get pulled down rather than pulling everyone else up mm -hmm. uh, quite often because of disruptive behavior yeah. we have a real big discipline problem in this country but the grammar school system kind of sets people aside. If, if you have, you know, if you're gifted or talented and you can pass that examination, get through into um, an academically excellent environment, then you're going to thrive. You know, my mother went to a grammar school and she thought it was fantastic. What I find funny is that all these politicians that send their kids to grammar schools or went to grammar schools are the ones that are campaigning against them. Oh, it's yes. double standards. Or, or indeed uh, went to private or make sure that their kids go yeah. to private schools. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's extraordinary. No, it was, I think that, I think when it came to Oxbridge, uh, it was something like 60% came from state in the, in the old days, 40% mm. private. And it's entirely flipped now. It's entirely yeah. flipped. Um, but... And it seems there, there seems to be no way of it coming back, mm -hmm. despite all the efforts. So it's a great shame. Um, you mentioned your your mum there, uh, Calvin. Uh, are, well, are they political people too? Your parents? Uh, yeah, quite. So growing yeah. up, my mother used to have councillors around all the time. She was like a community leader. She'd get like, litter picking uh, groups going on, and you know just all local issues, but she'd have Labour Party members around the table, Conservative Party members around the table, and she'd facilitate everything. And it was very much, you know, I, I experienced that everyone could get along as, as long as you're all working towards one cause yes. that everyone cares about. And that was very important for me growing up. Yeah. But my mother's probably a bit more conservative leaning. My father is very Labour leaning. Um, so I've got two different perspectives <laughs> there as well, which, which is fine, which is what it should all be about. You know, the old left and the right used to get on. It's this new woke left that sees us as yes. evil and bad guys and can't really relate to us in any way. But if, you're, if your father is more on the left, your mother are conservative, but presumably, as you say, in, like in the old fashioned way, they have certain things in common that they think are good. In other words, they have the good of the country at heart. Right. Is that right? Is, would that be accurate? Well, that's what politics is, isn't it? Isn't yeah, it? We all yeah. want to solve the same societal problems, but we have different solutions yeah, yeah. to getting there. Or oh, that's what it used to be about. And I think we've lost that. Mm. We've become so polarized and everything's very binary now. It's good versus bad, yes. right versus wrong, rather than looking to work together to yeah. help improve society for everybody. So it was actually quite a political uh, environment you had, really, right. in a way. Yeah. So you must have been Compared to most kids, actually, I would have thought pretty well informed about politics actually quite early on. But well, it wasn't really like national politics or, or party politics. It was like planting trees in the local park, you know, and, and get, getting funding for local bins and that yeah. kind of stuff, yeah. which is, you know, important stuff that normal people care about. Mm. And we forget about that quite often in politics as well. Yes. We get stuck in our ivory towers thinking about whatever grandiose problem we, we want to dream about and forgetting what normal people on the ground are concerned with, which is why I'm involved with Defund the BBC as an example. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you don't watch the BBC presumably anymore? Not at all. Goodness <laughs> man. Oh, so yeah. woke. It drives me nuts. Yeah. As we're recording this, there's a, an article gone out from the BBC. Um, Diversity Chief, I think is her job yeah. title, yeah. saying that Luther, this oh, program right. starring Idris Elba, yeah. um, he wasn't a real black character because he didn't have any black friends and he didn't eat any Caribbean food. So that's, that's how you determine if someone is really black or not these days, by the color of their friends and the food that they eat. We've gone back to tokenism. Oh, in a big way. It's yeah. disgusting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, no, I mean, because, you know, it's almost like back, it, it, that has resonances with, uh, well, you know, when I was growing up. So I am not racist. Some of my best friends are black. <laughs> exactly that, exactly that. You know? I, I sent that in a message to, to my friend uh, on the way to come to your studio, actually, because that's the point we've reached. We've gone backwards. Yeah. Rather than saying everyone's an individual, everyone yeah. is equal, you yeah. know, you can have friends. We live in London, for goodness sake. We've got yeah. friends from all over the place, yeah. you know, all different yeah. backgrounds. I was at the pub with you the other day. Yeah. So many different people from different walks of life. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I happened to be the only one with 
brown skin from a Afro-Caribbean ethnicity. We didn't notice. I didn't. I don't know if no, you did. No. But people on Twitter seem to, and people, you know, have a, something to say about that. So people have started to see color again and really focus on it and make it something important when it shouldn't be. It's the least interesting part of my personality, I think. Yeah, but the thing is, is that basically that's been the whole entire motive, isn't it, behind identity politics is actually to push all these characteristics right to the front. Yeah. You know. But again, it's a form of control because it's an immutable characteristic. It's not something that I can change. Yeah. So if they can control it, they control me. Mm. That's what mm. their thinking is. Mm. Begs the question, uh, Calvin, you know, if you're very interested in politics, all these campaigns, mm. in the long term, do you see yourself doing anything political, electorally? Oh, not electorally, no. I've, I've done that. I've, I've run for council. I've run for, I, well, I almost run for... Um, in the general election for the Brexit Party. Oh, did you? Yes, I was standing against Anna Subri oh, in Bropstow. Right. Oh, right, right, yep. okay. Good. Which was really funny because I helped her campaign to get in in 2015. Right. And then, of course, she was she was a good Conservative back in the day, but, of course, she went really Ramona crazy. Yes. Um, left her constituents behind on her campaign to reverse Brexit and reverse the biggest democratic um, results we've ever yeah. had in this country, uh, which was a shame. So I went up to campaign against her. I didn't end up running. I was one of those that stepped down to make sure that the Conservatives got in so that they could deliver right. Brexit. Right, Not yes. that the Conservative Party are thankful for that. But... Um, I don't know. I don't see myself running again. I've had, I've done that. It's been fun. That, I'm behind yeah. the scenes now, making uh, influence in different ways, and I, I think but, that. Yeah, I think the thing is as well is that you just don't have the freedom that you might want. I mean, as soon as you get into electoral politics, you know, you find you have to sign up to some yeah. some politics you don't really believe in, yeah. and it, you have to tone other things down, and all of this. It's it's terrible. Yeah. You know, I think, but um, but um, but you are you sort of like. Are you you're involved in the campaign at the moment, or you're helping? Yeah, I'm helping a number of parliamentarians. I advise people all the time, uh, mostly from the Conservative Party. I'd be happy to advise people from the Labour Party if they wanted my advice on yeah. race issues and all of this kind of stuff. I'm supporting Lawrence Fox in the Reclaim Party, um, which I think he's going to do a fantastic job in London. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, bringing some common sense back to politics as well, mm. and just really holding the Conservatives to account, much like the Brexit Party did. We yeah. need them to be dragged back to the right a bit because they shift left and left and left, uh, further left all the mm. time and forget what they are supposed to stand for. Well, I think that UKIP originally and then the Brexit Party yes, yes. did do a good job of actually doing that. I mean, of actually basically pressurising the Tory party. But it always seems to be, does it not, that that's what has to happen. Um, you know, it would be nice in some ways to have a, I feel, a proper Conservative Party. But, you know, it, in fact, we haven't got that. I think this obviously, you know, might be the, might be the way. Well, it um, seems whenever Lawrence talks about something, the Conservative Party pick it up the next day. Yeah, oh, these, yes. these cultural wars issues that people, yes. normal people care about. So it's good that it's happening. Yeah. What has your general approach been uh, to the lockdown situation? I mean, first of all, what's your... Mm. What has your own life been like during this past year? I mean, how, you know, how has it affected your life? Have you stayed at home? I don't think so. I mean, I wouldn't thought. Um, without incriminating myself too much. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, I mean, I don't, you know, don't. I mean. So uh, the first lockdown, I thought, you know, I gave them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I thought we don't really know much about the virus. We don't really know how to mm. respond to it. Um, so I, I assumed the government were working off good science, although it did seem that lockdown was a technique that had been copied from Italy, which had copied it from China. So I was yeah. a bit dubious about it, but you know, I gave them the benefit of the doubt. It didn't seem to work. Um, it didn't seem to have the desired effects, but we've continued to try it over and over again with the tears and with the lockdowns. And I think it's detrimental to people's well-being. Mm. You know, we're gonna over the next year or two, we're gonna see so many cancer sufferers unfortunately dying before their time is due because of they haven't received the treatment they've been deserved, uh, they've been owed. Um, we've protected the NHS, the NHS hasn't protected us. And I don't think if it's fit, I think if it can't protect us, it's not fit for purpose. It needs mm -hmm. reform, mm -hmm. it needs some serious change because they've thrown money at the problem that hasn't helped. Lockdown has been t so bad for people's mental health and their spiritual health. Mm -hmm. And I think the next campaign has to be making sure that no government can ever take our civil liberties away from us ever again. Um, we have to fight tooth and nail to make sure that happens because even the more moderate or should I say the more libertarian conservative politicians have been saying, you know what, we'll give the government the benefit of the doubt, we'll give them until this date or to, until this criteria is met. And the government keeps shifting that goalpost mm -hmm. repeatedly. 
Um, so there's not really anyone backing our corner or really standing up for our civil liberties. There are, there are a few, you know, less than a handful of people that have stood mm. up in Parliament, but this, that's not okay. I would have expected something like this from the left, not from a centre-right mm. party in, in our government. It seems to me that we've kind of lost track of what we believe in in this country. Which is I think the, the most worrying thing of the, recently has been, well, uh, you know, this morning uh, they were filming this. There was this headline about, first of all, about the number of COVID cases now reduced because of it's just being put on the death certificates, you mm. know, a, a quarter, I think, mm. which is what a lot of people warned about and talked about. It's, sort of, it's now become official. But it was also when the Prime Minister said basically that, look, vaccinations are great. Um, but really, it's lockdown that's actually really made the difference. And you sort of thought, oh dear, here, here we go. We're, this is like limbering up, yeah. you know, for another lockdown. So how come this one worked and all the other ones didn't yes, work? Yes, yes. But you, you're right in that it's so sinister that if you die uh, having had COVID at some point, you're down as a COVID death, whether that was what killed you or not. Mm. Whereas if you die after having the vaccine, I don't think they'll put you down as a vaccine death. You know, it only works one way, doesn't it? It's very, yes, very sinister yes, that. Yeah. Um, I'm quite worried about the way they're pushing these vaccines. I think it's, it should be an individual's right to choose mm. to take a vaccine or not, especially given that it was rushed. You know, we won't have the full clinical trial data until 2023. Mm. Uh, I'm not anti-vax whatsoever, but I do think it should be an individual's right uh, to choose. And if we say that we can only access certain parts of society with a domestic vaccine passport, that to me is, again, taking away our civil liberties and our freedoms, and it's not acceptable. We have to fight against it. I haven't yeah. decided if I'm going to get the vaccine or not yet, but if I do, there's absolutely no way I'll have a dom domestic vaccine passport or certificate or whatever they want to call it. I think there's a, there's a real possible problem, see, like uh, we're in London doing this, and, and there's a possible problem, for example, in London, where you've got a significant number of people who have not had the vaccine yet, including people working in, it, in the NHS. But you will have a two-tier society working its way out. It's the clean versus the unclean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've got to a point now where pretty much all the vulnerable people in our society have been vaccinated. The people mm. that account for 99% of COVID deaths mm. have now been vaccinated. So why have we not completely opened up society? Mm. Why are we still mm. locked down? Why are we still restricted? Mm. And I think it's a case of the government doubling down. They've made some bad decisions over you know, the pandemic and they want to double down and make sure that it's seen that they what they did was right, which mm. is why Boris Johnson's saying that it's the lockdown that's improving mm. uh, the, the death rate and the hospitalizations rather than the, this amazing vaccine program that they should be proud of because you know it's war beating this vaccine program. Mm. Well, exactly. Um, but I think they're all thinking, aren't they? Public inquiry coming, mm, yeah, public exactly. inquiry, how do I cover myself? Um, you mentioned there about people's mental health and their spiritual well-being. Um, you're quite a man of faith, you, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and I'm very interested in the question of faith at the mm. moment, Carl, for all sorts of reasons, partly because of the extraordinary cultural attacks that we've been under lately, and it's, it's brought it to the fore. Were you always a, a person of faith? Were you, as a, as a young, um, as a kid or a teenager, or is this? I've always believed in God. Yeah. Um, I didn't always have a faith. I didn't always know how to articulate it. Um, I'm a Christian, mm. um, Anglo-Catholic. Uh, it took me many, many years to find that route and find the place that, yeah. You actually found Anglo-Catholicism, yeah, right, I see. Yeah. Um, so that was a, a journey of exploration until I, I experienced what I consider an encounter with Christ that, mm. and that brought me to the Christian faith properly. Um, but I think the fa question of faith is the biggest question of our time. Mm. I think most of the problems we are seeing in society are due to a lack of faith. This used to be a Christian country and we used to have pretty much social cohesion. It used to be a fantastic place to live. And all of these extremist groups that we're seeing pop up are, I think, an answer to that lack of spiritual well-being and people looking after you, you from a spiritual perspective. You know, the church backed away during the first lockdown. It was almost unforgivable what they did in closing churches for the first time in hundreds of years when people needed them the most. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think there was a real chance, an opportunity for mission and evangelism to step in and say, you know, we've got your back, we're here for you. And they didn't do that. And I'm really, really saddened by that. But we see people latching on to, to these extremist groups like Extinction Rebellion and Black Lives Matter and you know all these Antifa, all these horrible toxic groups because people need in their lives a sense of belonging. Mm. They need to feel a part of something bigger than themselves. Mm. And that's mm. quite right. Mm. But in this country, we used to have that British sense of duty. 
uh, of, of service to each other, to our community. And I think a lot of that has been lost since we lost our Christian faith as, mm-hmm. a, as a country. And we're replacing it with all these horrible extremist left-wing groups. There is a very strong religious element. It's been said before, it's nothing to, for example, wokery. Mm-hmm. There's a very yeah. strong religion. Even, in, even with the Black Lives Matter thing, you, even in the actual ceremonies of it, you yeah. would see like the washing of feet. Yeah. It was this very, very kind of religion. But so y- your faith has, has, has been there for quite some time. I mean, and y- would that have come before the politics for you? Um, Because you know that there's a very strong correlation between people who believe in God and are devout and going into politics. It just happens to be one of the interesting things about public life. I think if I look at the timing, it's around a similar time that I found my my faith and found my voice in politics. But my faith very much shapes my politics. Like I, I, I have lots of libertarian values, but not completely because I believe in... We, have, we, we are individuals, but we also have that sense of duty to each other. Mm. And it's important to, to appreciate people's right to do whatever they like, as long as they're not hurting other people, but also as long as they have that responsibility with the right mm. to each other. And we mm. forget that part of it quite often on the right of politics, I think. Mm. Where are you going sort of uh, next with, what do you do? have you got any gigs coming up where we can hear you I mean like uh, on mm. uh, radio or anything because you're on all the time or are you also <laughs> yeah. writing for the mail and, and things like in the telegraph and all yeah. of these places so I write for the mail and the telegraph regularly um, I'm doing st- some stuff for react life uh, what on, is that react life right? so that's Ian Martin's uh, oh, right. new publication right um, yeah, just, whenever people call me up and say, have you got an opinion on this, Calvin? If I have an opinion on it, I'll write for them. <laughs> if I don't, I'll say no thank you. Um, I hope you're charging them. Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Look, thanks very much for coming on, Calvin, and, and talking. It's, it's really fascinating. And, um, and uh, well, we shall, you know, look out for him. He's obviously a rising star. Uh, has written, indeed. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Always a pleasure. Um, that's it. Uh, please do remember to subscribe, won't you? I know I say it every time, but uh, that's because I mean it. Um, and uh, do that, and we shall see you next time on So What You're Saying Is, okay? <laughs>